Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to discuss a group of organisms that are loosely called minor medically important. The only thing that makes them minor medically important is the fact that you or I are not infected with them. The moment we become infected with them, however, they become major medical importance. So let's begin with the first organism that was shown to be transmitted by an arthropod vector. So it has some historical importance. It's called Babesia. And Babesia is a malaria-like protozoan infection that infects red blood cells. It's also very important with regards to animal husbandry because it causes disease in cattle. And for that reason, Theobald Smith and his colleague, Dr. Kilborn, worked on cattle-borne diseases, trying to find out, A, the causative agent, and B, exactly how they acquired their infection. And what they discovered was that Texas cattle fever is caused by Babesia bigemina, and it's transmitted by a tick. And that data preceded all of the data that we have with regards to the arthropod-borne diseases like malaria, trypanosomiasis, and leishmaniasis. So these two gentlemen paved the way for the thinking process, which allowed others to look for other arthropod-borne diseases as well, recovering uh, the information from much, much more clinically important ones like, say, for instance, malaria. Babesia does cause disease in humans. It's transmitted to us as it is to other animals by ticks. So you now know that it's not just a disease of other animals. It's got a broad range of hosts to choose from, depending on the biting behavior of the ticks. And there are many, many species of ticks, and many of them can transmit Babesia. It's mostly a mouse to tick to mouse to tick to mouse disease. But as I said, in, in some cases, it can spread from mice to people and in Texas, of course, it doesn't involve mice, it involves cattle. It's found both in the United States and throughout Europe. And Babesia species of all kinds uh, cause major economic loss to a, a variety of, um, of uh, economic uh, engines, so to speak. The cattle industry particularly is concerned about tick-borne infections, and this is one of the main ones that they are worried about. So, but the historical reason for including this in a discussion of parasitic diseases is the fact that these two gentlemen uh, paved the way for the thinking process that led to other arthropod-borne diseases being identified. It's treatable with a tovaquone and azithromycin or clindamycin and quinine. Um, you can prevent it, of course, by getting rid of the ticks or preventing them from inviting you to begin with using a DEET spray of uh, some sort. Uh, you can avoid endemic areas of uh, high transmission. For instance, Nantucket happens to be the, one of those areas in the United States that has a very high deer population, and it has a very high tick population. And if you are minus your spleen for whatever reason, if you acquire Babesia infection, it's got the potential for a fatality. So it's recommended that you don't go to Nantucket on your summer vacation if you're missing a spleen. And there are lots of other people that catch this infection too, and it's a very difficult infection, A, to diagnose, and B, to treat. But nonetheless, uh, we deal with it. Cystoisospora belli is another one of those rarely occurring infections in humans, uh, but nonetheless, it still c continues to occur, so we must discuss it, at least uh, the bare bones of what it causes, how to identify it, and how to treat it, perhaps something about prevention as well. It used to be known as Isospora belli. It's been changed to Cysto Isospora belli, and it's <clears throat> for that reason that we've uh, um, angst over its pronunciation. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. It has a direct life cycle. It has an oocyst stage that's uh, reminiscent of the uh, apicomplexa that we discussed with regards to uh, toxoplasma and with... Um, uh, cryptosporidium. The oocyst is ingested and infects the small intestine, which at that point it causes a watery diarrhea, resembling that of cryptosporidium, but not quite as intense. There's some fever associated with this, abdominal pain, weight loss, general malaise. 
We can identify this, of course, by simply identifying the oocysts by microscopy. Treatment is with um, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, also known as Bactrim. Prevention, of course, controlling the spread of feces in the environment, proper sanitation. It's a rare infection, but um, worth noting the fact that it still is occurring on a global basis throughout the world. Cyclospora chiatinensis has risen to the headlines of public health in recent years as the result of outbreaks traceable to raspberries being imported from Central America. Now, how fecal contamination occurs on raspberries is a matter of conjecture because raspberries are high bush berries. They're not fertilized by um, the typical way of spreading manure out on a field. Uh, these are very specifically grown in, in ways which one would assume prevents exposure to human feces, but because of field workers and their need to defecate every day, just like you and me, uh, they can easily spread that infection if they happen to have it to the produce that they're picking. It arrives fresh. Raspberries are usually eaten without washing them in many cases. And as a result, Cyclospora chiatinensis uh, emerged as a, an infection uh, which affected some uh, two or 3,000 people uh, in one of the major outbreaks that occurred throughout the American South. It's an, it's an infection that spreads fecally orally. It's direct. Uh, there's a cyst stage. We ingest it. And are there reservoir hosts? We're not sure. We're actually not sure if Cyclospora has a reservoir host or not. Uh, we're still trying to work on aspects of its epidemiology to explain all the results with regards to these disease outbreaks. So until those results are known, uh, we'll just have to guess. It's a watery diarrhea. It's indistinguishable from that induced by cryptosporidium or by uh, cystoisospora. So we'll have to do some microscopy or perhaps we can do a, uh, a test for its nucleic acids. In either case, we can make a positive diagnosis. And once we have, Trim trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is the drugs of choice, are the drugs of choice. Prevention, again, proper sanitation, uh, of course, ensures that you won't encounter this parasite very often, but it can't guarantee that you will never encounter this infection. And now we come to an infection which is not really a parasite at all, at least not in its uh, normal life cycle. It's an amoeba it's also a flagellated organism, so it's called an amoeba flagellate. Its name is Negleria fowleri, and until 1970, it wasn't even known as a cause of infection in humans. It causes a disease called PAM, or primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, and the clinical symptoms from this are very serious indeed. It results from exposure to the cyst stage, which is found on the muddy bottoms of warm bodies of water, which attract people in the summertime where they go swimming. And if you happen to like to dive into the water or cannonball your way into the water, uh, the chances are that you will stir up the bottom and a plug of water will go up into through your nose and has the opportunity at least of bridging the cribriform plate and entering the brain tissue at that level. And that is exactly how we think this organism gains entrance into the host. The signs and symptoms for infection from Negleria phalari are serious and they're all neurological. Um, they're unidentifiable in terms of specificity. You will not know what's causing this until you biopsy the tissue or PCR to find out which Nucleic acid responds best to this test to tell you that it's one of these organisms shown here. In fact, these are all the same organism. Here's the amoeba form. Uh, I'm sorry, it's labeled as a flagellate, flagellate form, but I think you would consider this one as an amoeba because of its pseudopods that are being thrown out. It's also referred to as a trophozoite stage. It's, it's a mixed metaphor here because the flagellated stage of an amoeba is sort of a contradictory term. Uh, I wouldn't worry about the classification of this necessarily. Just know that it's a free-living organism that's found in the environment. It has nothing to do with parasitism whatsoever. 
Its, its reproductive cycle, its ability to feed and reproduce, is solely dependent on the ecology of this warm body of water over here. The moment we encounter it, however, and acquire it into our nervous tissue, that's when we begin to suffer greatly. There are many deaths throughout the world. All of these colored areas over here show where it's been found. Deaths are associated with this infection. We have treated with all kinds of antibiotics and antimicrobials, and it turns out that amphotericin B and miltificine together and in combination have actually cured several patients of this infection with residual brain damage, I might add. Prevention is almost impossible because how do you tell a little kid not to go swimming in the summertime? You don't. Um, and particularly throughout areas where the water heats up above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, that actually selects for this organism in that environment. So it remains one of those unsolved, unsolvable problems that if you're lucky enough, you will avoid it. And if you're one of the few unlucky people in the world, you will acquire it. And when you do, it'll be a very serious infection indeed. Another opportunistic infection is caused by Acanthamoeba species. Uh, one of the main species is Castigliani. So Acanthamoeba castigliani is the dominant species that causes uh, an eye disease in people throughout North America. It causes a keratitis of the cornea. It's a granulomatous encephalitis that also can result if it evolves beyond the corneal infection. It can actually uh, crawl because it's an amoeba. It can crawl along the surface of the eye along the optic nerve and enter the brain tissue in that way. It's found in the environment. It is not a normal inhabitant of human tissue. It lives off of bacteria that it feeds off of in the environment. So acquiring this um, organism uh, presents the body with some unusual problems that it has never encountered before because the exposure to this is rare. It's primarily a disease of people who forget to wash their contact lenses in the solution provided for them and instead use tap water. The tap water might contain the cyst stage of this organism. And in fact, in many cases, it does. The cyst is then included underneath the contact lens. The warmth of the host stimulates the cyst to exist into the trophozoite stage shown here. The, the trophozoite then starts to erode away the tissue of the cornea at the area of contact between the contact lens itself and the uh, cornea. The result is blindness. And the treatment is by corneal transplant. So that's rather a severe treatment, if you can imagine it. Prevention is to use sterile contact lens cleaning solutions. That's, that's the basis for all of these modern cleaning solutions that, uh, that all common uh, drugstores sell. No problems there. But there are still people out there that will opt for um, tap water. And that's a shame because that, this is one of the possible results. A recently emerged infection has been identified and named Balamuthia mandrillaris. The mandrillaris part is rather telling in terms of knowing where this organism was first detected. In fact, it was first detected in a zoo animal, a mandrill. It's an organism which is normally found in soil. It's an organism which exists both as a trophozoite and a cyst. So it has a resistant stage as well as a, as a stage that causes the pathology in this case. It's able to gain ent entrance into the skin first, usually through an abrasion. Let's imagine that you're out doing gardening in the lawn and you're kneeling down without any pads, or you're wearing your shorts and you're crawling underneath the rhododendron to make a few changes in your flower arrangements. And you scrape yourself on a branch, a little stick perhaps, and the dirt that you've acquired by kneeling has included in it the cyst stage of Balmuthia. The organism then exists. The existed stage, the trophozoite, 
being in a very strange place indeed, starts to erode the tissue in the local area. And you see, this almost looks like this patient has been bruised. But in fact, what you're looking at is damaged tissue caused by a long-term infection uh, induced by this trophozoite. Eventually, however, the trophozoites can erode through the superficial tissues and enter the blood supply. And when that occurs, of course, they have the option of being pumped anywhere in throughout the body. In, in the case of the fatal cases, it has resulted in infection in brain tissue, shown here. Each one of these rounded objects is a Balmuthia mandrillaris. And you can see the ring-enhancing lesions that they create also resulting in fatalities. Diagnosis is difficult once the organism escapes from its lesions in the skin. We can biopsy, of course. It would be difficult to distinguish skin cells from perhaps these tree-like trovozoites, unless, of course, you had a specific stain to differentiate them. There are a nucleic acid tests that can be run on the tissue and on blood, to identify the presence of the genome of the organism, or a portion of the genome, as you say. And then there's a, a rather specific indirect fluorescent antibody test that's been developed for detection of uh, the infection in, in, in patients that are, exhibit these kinds of lesions. But there have been fatalities from this disease, and there will continue to be fatalities because it's a rather rare occurrence associated with exposure to soil and um, Virtually every kid in the world plays in the dirt at some point in their life. And so they run the risk of acquiring this infection. There are multiple drug treatment regimens that have been described. Almost none of them work. So it's a rather sad outcome for this infection if it manu manages to go from the skin to the brain. Blastocystis hominis is an organism of disputed reputation, so to speak. It's been known about for a long time, uh, but it's also been thought to be a non-pathogenic organism. It's often found with other pathogens, and it's associated with fecal contamination. So most of the uh, cases that exist with regards to Entamoeba histolytica, or as we will see, uh, another protozoan infection, Dientamoeba fragilis, those patient um, samples often contain blastocystis hominis as well. And it was thought that the disease is being caused by these recognizable protozoans. But there have been many cases of pathology, let's say mild diarrheal episodes, episodic over a six month to a year period, where nothing was found except blastocystis. As the result, the accumulated evidence has implicated blastocystis as a causative agent in some cases of mild diarrheal disease. It's easy to diagnose it. It's even possible to raise this organism in vitro. And here's a, 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 a photomicrograph of a section of culture from this organism. It's an anaerobe. It's treatable with metronidazole. And when I say treatable, I don't mean treated. I mean treatable. The drug itself has an effect on the outcome, but it's temporary. The organisms are not completely eliminated from the environment. And as a result, the patient can relapse into a mild state of diarrhea, even after rigorous treatment with metronidazole. We believe that we can prevent infection with blastocystis with proper sanitation, although the, the um, incidence and prevalence of blastocystis hominis in non-pathogenic um, patient, sera and uh, not sera, I didn't mean sera, I meant in stools, forces us to believe that this organism is one of the most easily transmitted parasites from human to human. And as a result, proper sanitation may not prevent the spread of this infection. Dientamoeba fragilis is a rarely occurring infection in humans. It's 
acquired by the ingestion of a cyst that's only recently been identified by the fecal oral route. We acquire it. It creates a diarrheal disease. There's some nausea associated with it. It's not life-threatening. There's no dysentery. It's self-limiting. The examination of stool easily reveals the uh, double nucleated trophozoite stage of this, what is now termed an amoeba flagellate, just like Nicolaria flowleri. This is an amoeba flagellate, uh, so it's got a combination of organelles um, and falls into a different category than most uh, other organisms uh, in the protozoan kingdom. It's treatable with metronidazole, and when I say again treatable, in this case, I mean that there's a better than 80% chance that when you treat with metronidazole, you do get rid of the infection. And we do believe that in this case, we have evidence that suggests very strongly that by proper sanitation, you can limit the number of people that are exposed to this infection. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette. While in the Infectious Diseases Consultation Service at a hospital on Long Island during April, we were asked to see a 53-year-old man who lives on the North Fork of Long Island. This is east of New York City. He told us that he had felt poorly for more than a week with fatigue as well as muscle and joint aches. He tells us that he's been having fevers up to 102 degrees on his home thermometer. He's had stomach upset, loose stools, and dark urine. The patient was brought by his family, of whom no one else is sick, um, to the emergency room, and he was subsequently admitted. When we see the patient, he's already admitted to the hospital. A little more information about this gentleman. He has an acquired blood disorder requiring monthly red blood cell transfusions now for about a year. He also has a history of hypertension, high blood pressure. Now, past surgical history, he had a splenectomy in childhood after trauma. Not allergic to any medicines. Uh, he does report diabetes in his mother. He takes hydrochlorothiazide, uh, which is a diuretic or water pill for his hypertension. As far as occupation, he had worked um, in a retail shop, which he's now retired. He lives um, at home in a private um, house with his wife. He's never been a smoker. Uh, he was born in New York and reports only uh, traveling in the local area. Uh, as far as exposure history, he has two, uh, two dogs, large mixed breed um, dogs that stay in the yard. And he has some labs. I'll go through these just a little bit. Uh, his white blood cell count is 3.1. It's a little low. He is anemic at uh, 27 for his um, hematocrit. Platelets are a little low at 110. So low hematocrit, low platelets. He does have a slight elevation in his liver tests as well as his bilirubin. Now, putting the case together, we have a man in his 50s with fever, generalized symptoms, anemia, hepatitis, missing his spleen, transfusion dependent, and he's from Eastern Long Island. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about our patient. In addition to a number of other tests, we order blood smears on the patient, and this is very telling. Blood smear reveals 10% of the red blood cells with intraerythrocytic ring forms with Maltese cross or tetrad forms. Patient is diagnosed with transfusion-acquired babiosis, babesiosis, and the patient was treated with clindamycin intravenously as well as quinine. He did well, quickly dropping the level of his parasitemia. This was a whirlwind tour of organisms that have been shown to cause disease in people, but because the numbers of people infected are very low, they're referred to as protozoans of minor medical importance. Like I said before, if you happen to be the person infected with one of those, it's of major medical importance. We have several reviews on some of these organisms. Here's one on Dianthemia fragilis. Here's another one talking about the emerging impact on global health of intestinal protozoa in general. It's a good overview that I highly recommend. Uh, here's a, uh, an article about cultivating parasites as a way of identifying them. Uh, an article about Cyclospora chiatinensis, and it, it, it very adequately chronicles the outbreaks uh, traceable back to the raspberry uh, um, produce that I referred to before in Central America. We have some episodes devoted to a few of these subjects that you can access on This Week in Parasitism simply by going to microbe.tv slash twip. So thank you very much for listening. And next time we'll discuss hmm, a very interesting subject called non-pathogenic protozoans. Why would anyone 
ever want to know anything about something that doesn't cause disease. Tune in next time and you'll find out. Thanks for listening.